Episode 29, to be a victim or not to be a victim? That is the question. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the School of Preparedness. And thanks again for taking your time out to listen to me run my mouth. And and I know your time is valuable, and I know that there's so many other places you could be and so many other things you could be doing. But hopefully you're listening or watching this um, while you're getting a nice little workout or driving down the road or just hanging out while you're watching or while you're eating breakfast or lunch or dinner, whatever, and you just decide to, you know, hear me in your ears or watch me on your phone or whatever you're doing. But I just want to say thank you for that. And before we get going, if you haven't done so already, I'd appreciate you if you hit subscribe. Go to iTunes, hit subscribe. Um, Please leave a comment. Very important. Uh, let me know what you think. It could be just one word. I truly appreciate it. It helps get the word out to the show, helps with the rankings and everything like that. And as you know, as normal, uh, if you feel any of this content is valuable, please pass it on. But in today's show, um, I'm kind of kind of just do a little rant, right? Just some things that have kind of been on my mind, um, just after talking to people, seeing some things, but I still think it's very um, valuable to hit home. And that is, you know, being a victim or not being a victim. You know, what separates that? Or what can you do so you don't become a victim? And what do you do to become a victim? So it's like this, right? Um, You could be young, healthy, strong, fit, be trained, okay? And, you know, physically speaking, you might be able to handle yourself. You might be able to protect yourself. You might be uh, strong enough, fast enough, trained enough to protect yourself if somebody's trying to physically harm you, right? However, if you're older, You're injured, you're handicapped, you're uh, a mother with kids with you, a pregnant mother, Um, or if you're younger and you're listening to this, you're a teenager, right? And uh, an adult's trying to harm you, that's stronger, bigger and stronger than you. You know, what are you going to do then? You know, what things can you do? So we're going to get in to, you know, training like how you can protect yourself better. And we're going to get into how to avoid putting yourself in those positions to become victimized. And like I said, this is going to be a rant free. It's free flow. Okay. I didn't write anything down. This is just going to be off the top of my head. And it's just, you know, something that I feel is important, especially in today's time and age. All right. I mean, it is insane out there. If you live in the United States, Um, You see in most urban areas, most big cities, um, the crime rate is is catapulted, right? Catapulted. And we all know why. We all know why it all stemmed from um, the riots, the where, you know, they want to defund the police. and, And we all know where that stemmed from. When the police don't get involved, when the police step back, Guess what happens? The criminals get emboldened and then they do more things. Now, look, this is a, this is a story I'm going to tell you. Now, when I was a police officer, I was in a police academy and for the city of Cincinnati and we had a racial riot, right? Now, it doesn't matter what it was for, but it was a racial riot based upon a white police officer shooting an unarmed black, I think he was a teenager, right? However, there were so many things involved with this, right? Um, And it's, this happened back in 2000 
and it's still happening today. The way the media manipulates everything, the way the media turns things up, the way they make things political, the way that they, they try to push everybody to divide us. And, you know, at that time it was a racial thing and it's still happening today with the racial thing, right? And, and that's all based upon the political parties, right? And so what happened was this um, police officer was doing a detail, like an off-duty detail, meaning a business paid him money to stand in his uniform to basically protect the premises. And I think it was an outside club, it was in downtown Cincinnati, and this police officer worked in the downtown area. And he's a veteran officer, you know, he's been around the block a little bit. And uh, he was sitting there working, and he looked across the street, and he saw, or looked down the street, and he saw this, uh, this, this guy that he recognized. And it was a black guy, teenager, um, I think 19s or 18s, 20s, whatever. He wasn't like a young teenager in high school. He already graduated high school. And he remembered this kid from um, the bol bolos, Beyond the Lookouts. Apparently this guy had like 14 open warrants, some of them felonies, you know. So he, he was, um, he had some crimes against them. And these warrants, you know, obviously if a police officer sees that, then that means they got arrest, right? So he called it in and said, hey, we got so-and-so, he's got open warrants, and he started chasing this guy. And he chased this guy into a back alley. And, I, and, and from what I remember, I wasn't there, right? I wasn't there. But he ran in this, this alleyway, dark, and I think the kid, can't remember his name, was reaching down in his pants to pull his pants up or something. And the police officer thought he was reaching for a gun, and he shot him. I think that's how it went. And because of that, um, you know, a race... Race riots broke broke out, right? And the media fueled it, all right? The media sat there and, you know, said this this guy was executed, right? And then they brought up every other detail, every other police shooting that's happened in Cincinnati. Now, Cincinnati, it was a pretty racially divided city, you know, half white, half black. I mean, there's neighborhoods where whites and blacks live together, but it's pretty divided. So if you go into a certain area, it's all black or a certain area, it's all white. And like I said, there's some areas where it's mixed. So they were bringing up all these past police shootings, right? And they were trying to, because there was a, you know, predominantly a lot of them were um, black people being killed by the police. And, you know, a lot of them were justified and some of them, you know, weren't. Some of them had issues like they do today. I mean, it's, it, you know, police officers are humans. They make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, it's a bad mistake. It's bad. Sometimes it's intentional, right? Sometimes there is police officers that are racially motivated or have hatred or anger issues or can't control themselves, right? They're human beings, right? Being a police officer is one of the most difficult jobs that you'll ever have. You, you, have, to, you have to hold so many hats when you're a police officer. So, and you know, it isn't a job for everybody. You know, if you, you know, it isn't. You have to be honest as a person when you do those types of jobs. Can you handle it? Is this job for you? You know, personally me, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't really like the job. I don't like telling grown ass, grown up people, I don't like telling grown up people what to do and dealing with the, the worst parts of society day in and day out. I don't like that. Some people like that. But, you know, you have to just really analyze yourself to see if that job's for you. And, or if you're working in that job and it's really weighing on you and you, you, you know, a lot of the things you see, have, see throughout your career, if it starts hitting you. Because police officers, they got to deal with a lot of trauma on a day-to-day -day basis. Lots of trauma. Most people will never even experience a fraction of what most police officers that have been in, in the job for a while experience on a daily basis. And they, and they can't decompress. I mean, imagine you work eight hours and you're seeing dead bodies. You're, you're maybe, you have to fight for your life or in, you know, dead bodies either through violent crimes or car crashes or you know, somebody decided to kill their children or there was a shootout and an innocent child was killed. I mean, can you imagine seeing that kind of stuff? You know, and then you get off work, right? 
maybe you got blood splatters on your uniform or you have uh, some other type of bodily fluid on your uniform um, or maybe the smell of a dead body is on your uniform because you walked into a scene where there was a dead body in there and it's been in there for a long time and the smell of it's on you or maybe you dealt with a person who's um, you know a hoarder type that's basically urinated and 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 crapped all over their apartment or their house and and haven't taken their trash out and you that stuff seeps into your clothes imagine coming home and just you know trying to trying to just take your clothes off decompress and then going to sleep like nothing happened and then getting up the next day and doing the same thing again and again and again you can't decompress from that and you know a lot of these guys they bottle that stuff up inside and some of them can handle it and some of them can't. You know, police officers have one of the highest suicide rates, right? And a lot of alcoholism in, in, in for police officers. I mean, look, look at the veterans, right? Look, 22 suicides a day, all right? But, you know, at least with a, a veteran or a, a military person, you go get deployed and you might be in that environment for six months, a year or whatever. And then you go home back to the states away from that danger right away from what you what you dealt with for maybe another year before you go on deployment again or maybe you might not have to go on deployment for a couple of years but a police officer you know even firefighters non-stop man every day right every day they're seeing this trauma trauma and that ptsd man it kicks in and it's real right it's real i mean how can you get those scenes or those smells out of out of you and it's one thing when you can break yourself, detach yourself from it and, you know, um, separate yourself from that environment. But when you can't, when I mean, you got to go back to work every day, you know, five, six days a week, 10 hour days, eight to 10 hours a day, it's so difficult. So sometimes police officers, it builds up in them it builds up in them and then they explode or they do things they shouldn't do, right? Or they make mistakes, you know? So it's, uh, it's one of those things where um, as a civilian, as a regular person, right, um, you also have to have a mindset that is similar to um, the mindset police have to adapt to, right? When you're a police officer or when you're, whenever you're working a job where your life is constantly in danger. You have to have this mindset of survival, you know? And as a civilian, you have to have that too, that you're gonna survive no matter what happens, right? Your mind is very powerful. And, um, and I kind of lost my train of thought. And so if it kind of sounds detached, that's the reason why. But anyway, it's still important. You know, your mindset's so important, right? Because whatever kind of hardship you're going through in life, all right? Whether it's um, life-threatening, financial, maybe something with your relationship, maybe something with your kids or you lost your job or something. It, if you don't have a strong mindset that you're going to survive that particular situation, then, then that's when we fall, right? That's when you fall. That's when you crumble. That's when you allow all those things to take control. And... You know, a lot of times, you just got to wait it out. You just got to wait it out. And, um, oh, I know, sorry. So to get back to my story, right, I do that sometimes, you know, the ADD kicks in and, um, you know, I'll just start going off in one other topic. But, um, so going back to the police officer shot the unarmed black, riots happened, I was in the police academy, and uh, the media was trying to uh, basically say that the Cincinnati police has done nothing but murder black people. And, uh, and they try to use every example, you know. And when I was in the police academy, what they did was they came out to us and they talked about this issue. And they brought every single shooting incident that the police has had where somebody was killed. And then they explained every single one of them, in, every single one of the incidents, the story behind it, what happened. And I would say probably 80 to 90, well, probably more like 90%, um, maybe more, 90% of those incidents, and I forget the number, were justified, period, you know? But the way the media was saying it was that 
they weren't justified that the, these guy these these police officers were murdering people and you know if you have a city right and a large percentage of the city the population might be a certain color or if there's more white people or well Cincinnati it's half and half pretty much but let's just say the police department there's more whites than blacks right and there's a reason for that a lot of times um Sometimes it's just it's just the way things go, right? There might be just more applicants of a certain color than the other color. So, like, say, if you have, um, say, seven or six out of ten white, six out of ten are white officers, right? And the rest are black or other minorities, right? But then, you know, you might see a lot of white officers working in, say, an all-black area. So. If, if you're a police officer working in a particular area and you're dealing with, say, all blacks or Hispanics, you know, that type of neighborhood, same thing if you're a black officer and you're working in a whole white neighborhood. Well, if you stop, if you're a police officer and you stop and you do uh, interactions with um, people, traffic stops or responding to calls or whatever, who do you think you're going to be dealing with? If you're a white officer working in an all black neighborhood and that's your area, you think you're going to be dealing with a lot of white people or you think you're going to be dealing with a lot of black people? Same thing if you were a black officer working in an all-white neighborhood. Are you going to be pulling over or dealing with black people or white people? That's the way it is. So if, you're, if it's one of those situations where you have a lot of white officers working in a particular area and every person they deal with is another color, well, you know, does that make it racial because they stop these people? Or... You know, they arrest people of a particular color they deal with all the time? No. But what happened was, in this incident, that's what happened. The government got involved. They came down to investigate. Then they made us do all these racial profiling things every time we did a traffic stop. And it was crazy because, like I said, if you're a white officer working in an all-black neighborhood, most of the people you're going to pull over are black. So it's going to make that police officer look like he's racially profiling and pulling people over because of a color, you know? One of the areas I worked in was like an all-white neighborhood, a poor neighborhood, a lot of, a lot of crime, a lot of different stuff. But uh, I think there was maybe five of us working a particular shift, and it wasn't a real big area. And I was the only white guy. I was the only white officer. The, the other four guys were black. But they were working in an all-white, you know, predominantly mostly all-white neighborhood. So... It just happens, but the media doesn't explain it. And then what happens is people who don't have the background or experience um, in use of force or um, having an understanding of how uh, traffic stops go or you know, just when you're doing radio calls and your calls of service and you're dealing with people in general, they don't have a clue on any of that stuff. You know, like the whole like, so, so what happens is everybody gets everybody gets all spun up on this right they get spun up on it the political things come into play it, it, it becomes a mess right and so what happened in cincinnati is the city council the mayor turned their back against the police basically and then the police kind of said okay you know we're not going to write tickets anymore we're not going to do this we're not going to do that and they stepped back because they weren't being supported you know and if you're not going to be supported or you're afraid you're going to be uh, fired or, you know, arrested or, or, or sued because you're doing your job because somebody was trying to say you were bad, it's very difficult to do your job properly. So uh, imagine working in that environment every day. And uh, so, so what happens, right? So what happens is the police settle down on what they're doing because of fear, right? Then what happens is the criminals realize, okay, we can get away with this, we can get away with that. And then if you look at Cincinnati, how it was in 2000 to how it is now, you know, from my understanding is the murder rate's a lot higher, a lot more violent crimes, a lot more craziness going on. And a lot of that has to do with what happened, you know, 20, plus, 20 years ago, right? And that's what's happening now. You have the defund the police thing going on and all the different cities and states, you know, that are politically driven, right? They don't want to enforce this because of this or 
you know, they're afraid to have their police do their jobs because of the political ramifications and the fact that there's riots and, and you know, looting and, you know, people being hurt and killed, police officers being attacked, you know, buildings being ransacked, federal buildings being attacked, all because of a politically driven narrative, right? And um, that sometimes is not true, right? It isn't the true facts. But what happens is people don't listen to the real facts. And if you only get your information from one source and they're telling you one thing and you don't look anywhere else and you don't and you're you're not you're you're lazy in your research, then you're going to believe what they're telling you. And that's what happens. You know, I hate to say it, but largely a lot of people are sheep in this country, in America. And in other countries, it's the same way, especially if the media, the state runs the media. And essentially, that's how it is in this country. The state runs the media. The media largely is driven by um, one political party, you know. So the narrative's always the same. It's just that same thing. So if you constantly watch that and you're constantly being told one thing and you don't see outside the box, guess what's going to happen? That's what you're going to believe. So that's what we're seeing now with the crime rates, um, you know, jacking up everywhere. I mean, just look at it. I mean, what about all these incidents where um, the looting's going on? The people just doing these mass lootings where they're running into the stores and they're just stealing everything. And if they steal below a certain uh, price, they're not going to be charged. And some of these cities are, are allowing them to do, do that. And so you're seeing you know, 40, 50 people going into the store and just totally robbing everything, right? And it's only a matter of time, and there's been people that have been harmed and killed because of this, but it's only a matter of time before more people are going to be hurt and killed because of this, because the fact that the political aspect, the mayor, the chief of police, city council, is giving the police department directives on not to do anything because their fear of backlash, right? Their fear of more riots, their fear of this, fear of that. So what happens is, the, the crime is just allowed to continue. And then in other areas where the crime has always been bad, you know, with gangs and drugs and all that, and the police aren't, you know, there's no heavy presence and they're told not to, uh, you know, be as strong and as strict and as, as tough on, on the crime and kind of set back. Well, the criminals, what do you think? They're smart. They're going to sit there and take advantage of that. And they're going to push the boundaries as far as they can to see where they can go before the police or before the government, local, state, federal government steps in and go, look, this is enough. And we haven't reached that point yet, apparently, in a lot of places. So um, that story I told you about with Cincinnati, unarmed black, being killed by a white police officer, that's happening now, you know. And people just don't know the real deal. And we're seeing the ramifications of that. So how does this apply to you, right? Well, if you're living in an area where the crime rate's gone up, where there's you know, more people being robbed, more people being shot, more people being killed, okay? How does that affect you, you know? Well, and let's face it, you know, you know with, with the shortages going on out there because of this COVID thing that keeps happening, um, a lot of real jobs aren't out there, you know, um, people are desperate, you know, people are desperate and, uh, people will take advantage of that and they're going to try to find a way to be able to get things to either steal so they can sell it to make money. And that's where all that looting comes into play, or maybe they need something for their own survival. But, you know, a lot of it's just greed and they just want to make money. So... If you're just a regular person and you're living around areas where you have potential uh, predators running around that are desperate, all right, more so than normally, right? And desperation comes from a lot of things. It become, uh, they might need money for whatever. They have a drug ha habit and they need to fuel that drug habit, so they need money to be able to support that drug habit. So they get that money from stealing, right? Robbing and stealing. And... Um, so if you have an increased amount of predators running around, you know, then you have to be more especially observant and more prepared, right? And, you know, do you want to be a victim? All right, do you want to be a victim? And, or not? That's what you got to ask yourself. And you got to analyze yourself. You know, what's your capabilities? What is your current 
training background? What is your health? What is you know, your strengths? What, is, what are your capabilities? And honestly, look at that. And I will tell you that I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, I'm out of shape right now. And uh, I can handle myself. But if I had to fight somebody for an extended period of time, I'm, I'm going to be in trouble. Right? But I also have something else that can help me out with that. You know, I can, you know, I can still carry, right? So if I was in a situation where I was fighting for my life or I think I might have to fight for my life or I'm in, I think my life or my family's life is in danger, well, I have that tool that's going to help me out with that. But if you don't carry a tool, whether it be a handgun, pepper spray, a taser or something like that, but, you know, you got to remember, pepper spray, tasers, they're less than lethal and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So you, you got to have that understanding. Handgun, on the other hand, is lethal. However, sometimes you can just brandish it and give, a, and give it some type of command, and that might be enough to stop that particular situation. But the fact is, you could use it to protect yourself or those you love. And so after you analyze yourself, and based upon your particular situation can you protect yourself and if you can't how can you do it right so the better way to protect yourself so you're not a victim is try to get some training to learn physical um, tactics right self-defense um, and we well I've touched on that before in other other shows but I'll touch on it again you know do you want to learn how to protect yourself and or do you want to learn sport right so you have to understand the difference in that you have to understand like say if you go into a karate club and you want to learn self-defense the way they're going to teach you certain things and the way that they do things is not like really compatible to a street environment the reason why i'm saying that is is when you have a when you're when you're set in a particular environment that teaches you rules and they teach you to fight in a certain way, right? And you're being attacked in a certain way. But then if, if you put in an environment <clears throat> like out on the street, and now you're confronted by a street fighter who doesn't play by rules, who will do anything they can to win, okay? If that means pick a brick up and hit you in the head to win, they would do that. Or, you know, poke you in the eyeballs to win or throw something in your eyes to win. They're going to do that. So how can you train for that in a controlled environment where there's rules? It's hard, okay? It really is difficult. So my suggestion to you is, if, if you don't have a particular place where they have more realistic type training and scenarios, and the way you can do it is, you learn particular techniques, learn how to punch, kick, knee strikes, elbow strikes, defense, right? And you learn, and then, then if, if they can do drills where they manipulate that into realistic scenarios, then that's good. And you practice those scenarios and you practice those situations. That kind of, that can help train your mind a little bit better, right? Um, but if, if you don't have that type of solution for a physical training, um, my suggestion is then you get into, you try to find a place where you can train that has more combat, like real life combat, um, real tested combat, um, hand to hand combat type uh, training. And, uh, or even if it's a sport, and I would suggest MMA, uh, Muay Thai, boxing, and, you know, like wrestling, you know, those types of um, sport training. Uh, that has rules, but the difference is when, or jiu-jitsu, I forgot jiu-jitsu, BJJ. If you train in a BJJ club or a Muay Thai school or an MMA or wrestling, you are actually sparring all the time. You are actually doing like the thing that you need to do to truly protect yourself. So if, if, if you're training to know what it feels like to get punched and to hit back and to actually hit somebody, those types of um, sports, right? Those types of martial arts um, 
actually do that. That's what they do. That's pretty much all they do. They practice technique and then they spar, right? Or they do drills where they're hitting stuff. So you're getting used to the getting hit and being hit. So, and the training is difficult. It, it's hard. It makes you sweat, makes you breathe hard. So that's realistic, right? So find something like that. You know, if really truly analyze it. You know, a lot of these, you know, martial, a lot of these um, kind of traditional places, they're, they're, they're a waste of time, in my opinion, if you really truly want to protect yourself. Because what you have to do is not protect yourself against someone who you think is not trained and that can't throw a punch or is a drunk. You've got to train with the mindset you're dealing with some predator out there that's been in a hundred street fights, you know, that's been hit plenty of times in the head and face and knows what that's like and, and has gone all the way in and has done what they had to do to win. You got to train against a person like that, not against somebody who you've sparred before with pads on and that you know is your buddy and um, you already know their technique and you know what they can and cannot do. You got to train against somebody who's really legitimately trying to hurt you or kill you. And, you know, so it's difficult to find that. But like I said, find the real combat sports, you know, and then work with what you got. And then at home, or maybe you get somebody in there, work on, you know, think of more realistic drills. Like if you have any questions about that, you know, go to the school of preparedness.com and, uh, you know, contact me, send, shoot me a message, you know, and I'll, I'll help you out the best way I can. I'll give you my recommendations, come up with some drills that you can do to practice. So if you're doing Muay Thai or something where you're learning elbow strikes, you know, you can come up with some drills where you're doing that stuff realistically, right? Um, plenty of things. Just use your imagination. You can go on YouTube and find stuff, all right? But you got to learn to separate the BS from the stuff that actually works. And unfortunately, you know, YouTube is a great tool. It's, it's great for a lot of those things. And uh, however, it can also be a problem. But anyway... Analyze yourself. You want to do some physical training. Go in the direction I just explained to you. All right. Um, and, not, you know, in training, right, it's not just you have to practice at it. You have to really take your time out, practice repetition, repetitions to get it into muscle memory to be able to do it when you don't have to think about it. You know, so you just can't take, take some lessons once a week and be done. You got to practice that. Take multiple, two, you know, three times, four times a week, and then you got to practice at home. You know, you got to practice. So even if you're taking Muay Thai or MMA or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but you're only doing it two hours a week, okay, and you don't practice the repetitions, because when you're taking the class, you might one learn one, learn one or two techniques, but you're you're not doing hundreds of repetitions in class, and that's where that's where the true learning happens is when you do those repetitions, so you're able to do it without thinking, you know, and that's the way you want to be. Um, so you have to take the time out and it, and I tell you what, a lot of people, they don't, they don't have the discipline. It's cause it's a lot, it takes a lot of discipline to, to do that type of training or they don't have this resources. They don't have the places to go. They might live in an area like where I live at right now. If I wanted to go to a good place, it's going to take me an hour drive, just going there. But there's a couple karate schools down the street. You know, but I don't really know how they are, but I have a feeling they're not very good. So if I want to drive 20 minutes down the street to take some garbage, that's not really going to help me. Then what choice do you have? Okay, so if you're in a situation where you can't train and you don't know how to train, then what do you do? And that's where come in, you know, you might have to really seriously think about getting and getting some type of tool to use to to. Um, to help you with those weaknesses, right? So get a concealed carry permit, get some pepper spray, you know, get a baton or, you know, get a taser, whatever, you know, but you have to train with those items. You just can't sit there and, and you know, and this is really sad, but I live in Virginia and to get a concealed carry permit, you just have to take a three hour class, a class, and that's it. You take the class, 
and you get your little certificate, you, you apply for your concealed carry permit, and that's it. You don't even have to go to the range. And you're not really even learning anything. And a lot of people think that's sufficient. They think, oh, I got my concealed carry permit. Or maybe you live in a state where maybe you do, you do some shooting, a little bit of shooting. You really think an hour of shooting where really what you're learning is so basic and it's so watered down because an instructor can only teach you so much when he has a class full of brand new beginners. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you know, I apologize for the light hit me in certain areas. I got my window open and I don't want to stop talking. But anyway, if you're listening, check out the YouTube video. But um, handguns, I mean, you can't honestly think if you get a concealed carry permit or you're going to open carry, meaning you can openly carry it, let everybody in the world know you got a gun. If you're going to carry a handgun, and you don't train, not even a little bit, do you honestly think that you're going to be able to react properly under time of great stress? Because if you ever have to pull that gun out, it's because your life or the lives of those you love, your, your kids are on the line, and you haven't even trained how to draw that gun out of the holster. You know? I mean, it's not even about going to the range all the time. Because the range is only a certain small part of it. You know, the range, shooting on a live range with live bullets, you know, helps you when it comes to the sound, the concussion, recoil management, lining your sights back up, stuff like that, right? The physical movements. But however, you can do a lot of training just by dry fire. But you can also do a lot of training just by, you know, handling your firearm, getting used to it, getting comfortable with it feeling 100% comfortable with it. That includes drawing from your holster, concealed or open, however you carry it. Knowing where to place it, you know, knowing where to put your magazines, knowing how to get to your stuff when you need to, practicing doing it, you know, fast, you know, doing it in the dark, right? Um, practice drawing and getting in stances and turning movements and all these things that you have to work, right? It's more than just putting holes in targets, right? Or hearing the bang or this, the feel of the gun when, and the, when the recoil goes off. You know, it's more than that. You know, you have to be comfortable with that gun and that firearm and doing all those movements before you even get to that point. You know, you know I always say this. When it comes to firearms, man, uh, people do it backwards a lot of times. You know, would, if you played sports in school, and it was your first basketball practice ever, and you're in high school, would your coach put you to play on the championship game the next day after you only have one practice? No. What's the difference with, with handguns? You know, just because you go to the range and you shoot um, 50 rounds into a target in a controlled range environment where it's, it's fun and, you know, you think you're going to be able to do that for real when, when, when you're at the range and you can't even draw from your holster or you can't even do magazine changes or reloads? You think you're going to be able to do that for real if you don't practice it? So what I'm getting at is if you practice all that stuff, reloads, you know, fixing malfunctions, turning movements, drawing from the holster, conceal and open, whatever, knowing where your stuff's at, you know, getting to your stuff, in the dark, in the light, whatever. And you're able to do that proficiently. Then you can move to the range where you can put those bullets down range. Because guess what? When you get to the range where it's controlled and you can't do a lot of things for safety reasons, well, guess what? You've already practiced all that stuff and you're comfortable with it and you can do it. So then you could be at the range and then you can just actually focus in on you know, side alignment, side picture, your grip, and recoil management. And getting to feel what it, what it sounds like when you're shooting, you know, or the, the feel of it. And dealing with the concussive blast from the other people, which is all part of training. But if you don't know how, you're not comfortable with your gun and you don't even know how to use it, and then you get put in that environment right away, and you're, and you're nervous, 
nervous about using a gun because you never have and you really don't know what you're doing and then you're and you're in the middle of a class where there's 10 other people shooting at the same time and you had the blast going here and the blast going there and it's making you nervous already you're already nervous because you're not comfortable with a gun you don't even know you don't even how to how to manipulate it and then you go into a range and shoot live rounds that doesn't make any sense it's backwards learn how to use your gun get completely 100 percent comfortable with it okay first okay and then go to the range that way when you go to the range you can really just practice and concentrate on just putting rounds down range and then once you're comfortable with both then you can start getting more complex you know more advanced in your training if you're able to right but a lot of us we don't have the time we don't have the money to be going to the range and spending a you know two hours at the range shooting you know three or four or five hundred rounds you know who can afford that nowadays some of us don't have time especially if you got wife and kids and you got stuff around the house you got to do on the week you don't have time for that and you work full-time job you don't have time for that i mean shoot when i was a federal agent and uh really the only time that i usually fired was when we had to qualify a couple times a year but i didn't have time to go and shoot on the weekends yeah, you know, because I had to, I had to drive a certain amount of um, distance. You know, I didn't have time for that. So, what do you do? What do you do when you don't have the time and the money and to be able to go to the range all the time? Well, you can practice at home. As long as you're safe, you can do that. So that's my suggestion to you. You know, if you physically can't do things, analyze it. Then get a tool that'll help you out. You know, if that tool is a handgun then you better learn how to use it. You better understand that any time you pull that thing out and you have to actually use it, that it is life and death. And you have to be serious and know what you're doing. Because if you do have to shoot that gun and you do have to protect yourself, you know, what if you do not practice properly or you do not pay attention or you're not following the proper protocols, right? You know, and you shoot an innocent person, not only are you going to get charged, but you got to live with the fact that you shot an innocent person. Like imagine if, if a bad guy was coming at you and you freaked out and panicked and you pulled your gun out and you shot that person, but you weren't paying attention to the like, whole group of kids that were right behind the guy. And you shot a couple of kids. Yeah, you might have hit the bad guy taking him out, but you shot a couple of kids. Well, you're going to jail, but you got to live with that. But if you have proper training, you have the mindset, and you're paying attention to the whole totality of the circumstances, the whole environment, knowing what's going on, and seeing that, you know, hey, there's kids right behind there. I can't, you know, I gotta, if I, ha I gotta get away, I gotta put some distance, I gotta put something between me and this person, I gotta get some cover, try to get away. I can't shoot him at this point because I might hit those kids, you know? It's tough decisions, right? Those are split second decisions that you gotta make, just like police officers do. And if you're not trained, and you don't do any training at all, or all you do is you go to the range and you just pull your gun out and you just shoot a couple rounds and you feel like you're, you know, Mr. Cool because you could put a group that, 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 you know, small and with no stress involved and you feel good and, um, but you don't practice, you really think you're gonna function. You really think you're going to be paying attention to your environment and not get stuck in that tunnel vision where all you do is you just see that threat in front of you, but you don't see anything else around you because you have to totally take that whole thing. You can't have that tunnel vision because you might have that threat in front of you, but you also might have one on the side of you or one in the back of you. So, and without training, without actually working on those aspects, you're going to get that tunnel vision and you're not going to be able to perform under stress. You might get lucky and do it. You may get lucky, but if that person has a buddy, he, you're not going to get lucky again. So you do your training, you know. If you want to get a pepper spray or a taser, you better understand, you know, what that tool's about and the fact that it may or may not work. And if it doesn't work, can you recover from that? Because if you just have pepper spray and you think, oh, well, if a guy's messing with me, I'm going to pepper spray him and they're going to stop and they don't stop and they keep coming at you, are you mentally ready and physically able to respond to that and to be able to, you know, uh, fight that person off? Can you do that? And the answer is going to be no if you don't practice that. 
So think about those things. You know, if you carry a gun, practice, right? All aspects of it, drawing, movements, changing magazines, fixing malfunctions, dry fire, all that stuff. Get really good at it before you even shoot some rounds. I mean, if you want to shoot rounds the first time just to kind of see what it feels like, that's fine. But don't, don't just go to the range all the time and practice that without practicing all the other stuff. Practice all the other stuff first, then go to the range, right? If you can do some live hand-to-hand physical training, you know, self-defense, try to get the real stuff, okay? Try to do that. Or if you have no choice, you learn the techniques, then figure out ways to really practice that for realistic scenarios. Remember who you're up against. You're up against predators, right, that are looking for victims, right, that are looking for easy victims that they're going to take, take out. So if you look like a victim, meaning you're in a wheelchair, you're, you know, you're older, or you're not moving fast, you're not paying attention, you're, you know, so many different things that can make you look like a victim. You're going to be a target. A predator is going to get you. Okay? So don't look like a victim. Don't put yourself in position to be victimized. Don't do dumb things, right? You know, if you go to the club, you know, with your friends, don't get in stupid arguments with people because you're drunk or because they're drunk. You know, walk away. Because if you're dealing with certain types of people with that mindset, and, and let's just say you, st- you stand up to them, maybe you hit them and knock them down, well, they're going to go out to their car and they're going to get their gun and they're going to come in and shoot you or they're going to wait for you to come out. Or they're going to pull that knife out that they had in their pocket and they're going to stab you because they don't want to be embarrassed. So is it worth it? So don't be stupid, you know? Don't go, don't go to an ATM in the middle of the night in some bad neighborhood. Don't be stupid. Don't go fill your gas up in a bad neighborhood in the middle of the night. You know, pay attention to your surroundings. When you're driving your car, you know, don't get too close to people around you when you're stopped. Make sure you can get around them if you have to. Pick the outside lanes, you know. Pay attention to the street corners when you're getting ready to stop. You know, what's going on over at this street corner? Is there somebody that can run up to my car that looks like a threat? You know, just don't blindly go up to these corners. Be, be looking around you. Be paying attention to what's going on in the cars around you, okay? You know, you have raid road incidents going on all the time. So don't be a victim, all right? When you're walking down the street, you look behind you. If you're running in trails and, you know, don't sit there and have both your headphones in, playing loud music. Have one headphone out. Have the music down. Look behind you every so often. Make sure you look like you're paying attention when you're standing out on the street corner waiting for the bus, you know. Make sure you can see the environment around you, all right. Is the street the threat or is the sidewalk in the area behind you the threat? Position yourself to where you could see where the potential threats can come from. That means put your back up against the telephone pole or a wall. Do that. Make sure you can see around you. That's all part of having good situational awareness. It's also part of having you become, uh, not become a victim, right? To be a hard person for a predator to attack. Remember, predators are only going to go after the weakest prey that they can. They're not going to go after that strong person or that person that they think is going to be uh, a struggle or a fight for them because they want to win, right? They want to survive. They want to get their easy kill or their easy score. They want to get their easy robbery, their easy money. They're not going to go after somebody who they think is going to fight them. So don't be a victim. Pay attention to what you're doing. Be observant. Pay attention to the people around you. You know, what's their body language like? What is the environment itself like? If you're always in a particular environment and there's always a certain amount of activity going on and then you go in that environment again and you don't see that activity or you see certain individuals that aren't used to being in that area, those are all clues, you know what I mean? But you got to pay attention. When you're out and about, know your environment. Know where the exits are at and know where the stairwells go. And that includes malls, restaurants, whatever. Understand where everything's at and know and have a plan. Having a plan is important too. You know, always be thinking about what you're going to do if something happens here, something happens here. Play the what if game, you know. Sitting in a restaurant, don't put your back against the door. Try to put your back to where you can see everybody, all right. Have an eye, an eye on the entrances, all right. Know where all the exits are at. Same thing when you go going to church, all right? Know where everything's at. Pay attention to those people around you, all right? You know, body language is important, all right? What people say is important, you know? Pay attention to those body clues and those warning signs. 
don't be a victim, all right? If you're smart, you don't put yourself in those positions, you are not going to become a victim, okay? However, if you have to work in particular environments where the chances are higher that you might be a victim, then you better be prepared for that. If that means you got to go take some kind of self-defense or you got to carry some type of tool, then do it, okay? But I would suggest to you, if you can carry a handgun, conceal, or open carry, um, do so because you might be in an environment you're doing everything right and you could just be in the wrong place at the wrong time hence you're at walmart shopping with your family and then somebody walks in and starts shooting the place up and um and then you're gonna have to do something right um and pepper spray and your karate moves is not going to help somebody with a gun trying to shoot people up so that's why you know you got to constantly think of those things you got to you you know, if you're trying to protect your family and you got to worry about their safety and you got a couple people, a couple bad guys trying to do something to you, you know, karate moves might not work, especially if they're armed, right? So you got to be able to have some tools, but be smart and know what your tools are capable of, know their capabilities, know what pepper spray can do and what it can't do, know what a taser can do, and what it can't do. It won't work on everybody, guys. It won't. I'm sorry. And even if you got a gun, just because you think you got a gun or a 45, like everybody thinks a 45, you shoot somebody at 45, they're going to go down. That's not the case, man. You got to understand that for you to take somebody out, if they're, and you always got to be thinking they're high on drugs, so their pain tolerance and everything is so high and they don't feel it. And especially if adrenaline's pumping, you got to hit them in vital organs to stop them. So you have to train with that mindset you have to be ready for that you have to understand that understand that just because you got a gun doesn't mean you shoot somebody they're going to go down you might have to shoot them multiple times for them to stop coming towards you or stop their uh, aggression towards you you might have to do that and it happens all the time so understand your your the power the capabilities of whatever tool you're using especially with guns Understand that the gun is not a, it's not a toy, that if you actually have to use that, there are serious ramifications involved. You have the power of life and death, okay? You have the power to change people's lives forever, you know? If you're negligent with that and you shoot somebody that, that was innocent, you're going to go to jail and you got to live with that. And you deserve to go to jail. If you're negligent, you do something, you make a mistake because you weren't paying attention and you weren't trained and you panicked because you don't know what you're doing, you deserve what you get. Just like that police officer that thought she had a taser, but she had her gun, and she shot that guy and murdered him or killed him. You know, I don't care if the guy was running. But the point is, she could have shot the other police officers. There was one right next to her and another one on the other side of the car. She could have shot one of those guys. She, sh she could have shot the passenger who was not part of that whole thing. She could have shot somebody walking across the street because she was not trained properly. She was not paying attention to what she was doing. And she was a 26-year veteran. Think about that. Somebody had been carrying a gun for 26 years, had multiple classes in defensive tactics, and made that big mistake. And you think your little sorry butt who, who goes out and takes a three-hour concealed carry course where you don't even do any live fire, and now you got your little concealed carry permit in your wallet, and you think, uh, you think you're going to know what to do? You think you're going to know how to use that gun when you need to? And you don't even train? You don't even practice drawing out of the holster? You think you're going to do that? And you got a 26-year vet that, that's qualified multiple times and done multiple trainings? and screws up and makes a mistake because they weren't paying attention or they were under stress and they just were not paying attention because they didn't practice, you know, pulling the taser out under stress or just whatever. Or they're always constantly, maybe they only practice drawing their gun. I don't know. You think your little sorry bud who doesn't even practice is going to be able to function? No. No, 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 no. And I apologize for calling you sorry buds, but I just want you to get the point. It's not going to happen. You know, look, it's one thing if it's just you, right? But if you got to protect your family or there's somebody else that's being, potential being harmed, a friend or somebody, an older lady, older man that could be victimized, 
and you want to protect them. You know, it's not just about you, but like I said, you got to be able to protect those that can't protect themselves. You know, especially your family and kids. And if you don't know what you're doing, how are you going to be able to do that? And the only way you're going to do that is just by practice, whatever it is, whatever it is. Like I said, if you have any questions, contact me. You know, I'll love to help you out the best way I can. You know, but it all starts. You got to have that mindset, you know, to not be a victim. You can't act like a victim. So be smart. Pay attention to your surroundings. Don't put yourself in positions to become a victim. Pay attention to your area around you, your situational awareness. Pay attention to the people around you. The people are the predators. They're the human predators. Those are the ones that are going to go after you. Those are the ones that will kill you, okay? Pay attention to them. And if you get a gun, you know, practice, 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 practice. Anyway, that's enough for my rant. Thank you for taking your time out. And please, you know, subscribe. And once again, I can't say it enough. Please go over to iTunes. If you feel like you've learned something from this, please leave a comment. It could be just a one-word comment. I'd truly appreciate it. It helps me out. And if you think somebody could benefit from this, please pass it on. And if there's any way that I can help you out, please reach out to me. Remember, schoolpreparedness.com. Just reach out to me. Okay, I'm not going to spam you. you know, I'm not going to try to you know, sell you all kinds of stuff. But one, and just remember, this is all my opinion. All right? This is all my opinion. Okay? So you have to do the research. You have to figure out if what I'm saying to you makes sense and it's accurate. You have to do that. And if, this, if you don't think it is, respond back to me. Let me know. Okay? Let me know. But from the very beginning of this, I told you I'd keep it real with you guys. I'd tell you how I truly feel. And I'm not perfect. And I don't know everything. Um, but I always do my best to try to shoot, you, shoot it straight to you guys. But I just want the best for you. I just want to help you out the best way that I can. That's why I developed this thing. But, um, well, look, I got to get out of here. Got to get going. But uh, please be safe. Watch your six. And remember, it's not being paranoid, it's being prepared. Hey,